שם השם נעשה ונצליח, שבוע טוב, שבוע מבורך. ברוכים הבאים, we are uh, back here, starting a new week, continuing our series of the Jewish Ashkafa, based on the uh, Sefer by the Chazonish, Emona ובטחון. Uh, Tonight's show will be uh, for Ilui Nishmat, Sara Lea, Bat Arye Herschel Chaim. And uh, Lavdil also for Refua Shlema, for Rabbanit uh, Levana, Bat Sara, Rav Efraim Ben Shulamit, רבנית שרה בת ענת, אבי מורי דוד בן עשריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה. Um, also for uh, הצלחה רבה for מרשה בת ג'ולי, איילה בת מרשה, סמיל בן מרשה, ספס בן מרשה, אלכסנדר בן מרשה, לואיס בן מרשה, אמיר בן שאהין, שאול בן פרזנה, uh, אושרי בן דוריס, גבי בן דוריס, אלעד בן דוריס. Uh, David Ben Nesriya and all of Am Yisrael and all of the righteous Noahide that continue to watch our shiurim and support in every way that they can. Baruch Hashem. Uh, so um, tonight, Bezot Hashem, we're going to continue this series uh, in regards to uh, corrupt of judgment, whether it's judging ourselves, judging others, corrupt Bedin. Uh, try to uh, delve into a few things, uh, also address the issues that are happening out there in the world today. Uh, of course, uh, everyone is, uh, you know, or at least uh, a lot of people that uh, uh, are out there that are you know, sending me messages about what's going on with uh, Ukraine with, um, and Russia. Is this the end of the world? Uh, you know, is this Gogu Magog and so on? We'll, we'll try to address that right away. So to alleviate uh, uh, some of the, uh, I guess, the concerns that people have. And I said this in a video that we did and the other will publicize at some point uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and uh, this, is the, um, this is the important message that everyone has to understand that I think uh, we uh, addressed last week. Anyone that missed the lecture from last week How do I know God loves me? The big event that we had last week, Baruch Hashem, was fantastic. Anyone that missed it, uh, you really did miss a fantastic event, an event that had a lot of uh, great insights, a lot of relevance to day-to-day -day life, a open miracle uh, where uh, one of our uh, wonderful Talmidot uh, came to visit us a month ago from Seattle, got a blessing, and uh, came to tell us the story of what happened with that blessing Uh, just uh, last week, a month later, where uh, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu put in my mouth to tell her that she's not going to have, this, have the surgery that was already scheduled, and Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu simply fulfilled it. As the uh, Prophet says, in the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Prophet Jeremiah, Im kal mizolel If you will uh, help people do tshuva, you're going to be like my mouth. And uh, that's how it worked, where uh, we said something and HaKadosh Baruch Hu fulfilled it. Uh, now, of course, the, uh, the blessings that are out there are available for all, but not necessarily everybody receives them, just simply because there is requirements that uh, a person has to have, that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has to see if they're fit to receive such a blessing, if they're doing tshuva, if they're working on themselves, because unfortunately many times there are many blessings that are out there that uh, different uh, righteous people give to people, but they don't get fulfilled. And it's not that Hashem is rejecting the tzaddik, it's not that Hashem is rejecting the blessing, but rather he is burying it. He's burying it uh, because he's waiting for the person to, in essence, merit getting that blessing. Uh, that's why it says in our praying, Zorah Atzdakot. Zorah Atzdakot is that Hashem, in essence, he uh, 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 buries the, the tzedakah, he buries the, the, you know, these uh, blessings for when the, when the person earns them. And many times there are righteous people that give people blessings, but they don't get fulfilled uh, waiting for that person to earn it. And many times those people don't realize that the blessing is put on hold until they start keeping Shabbat and still until they start protecting their breed, until they do certain things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, decided this is, uh, this is the law and that you have to comply with just like the rest of Am Yisrael. And uh, this law is not only going to be a law for everyone and for you, but also is going to be, in essence, the, the door. The door that's going to uh, stop you from progressing uh, forward uh, unless, you, uh, unless you move, unless you do something about it. So, Baruch Hashem, we had the merit to not only give a blessing, but have fantastic students that earned those blessings and have them fulfilled. And Bezat Hashem, those blessings will continue. 
Now, uh, the uh, the people that are out, that came to the shoe, I don't really think had much of a question. But uh, the people that did not come to the shoe, or people that uh, perhaps uh, poisoned their minds to, with too much uh, television uh, or news, uh, surely are uh, bound to have many questions. Now, again, I'm not saying that a person should be completely oblivious of what's happening in the world. I just think that uh, we have to always remember what our goal is in life. Our goal in life is to do tshuva, is to serve HaKadosh Baruch at the highest level we possibly can. And that goal does not change regardless of what happens in the world. Meaning, before Corona or after Corona, doing tshuva was still the, an obligation. Uh, before the, uh, uh, you know, whatever uh, scam they came up with, with in regards to this... Uh, uh, forcing people to take the vaccines. After it, we have to obviously uh, uh, do tshuva. Before the war, after the war, we have to do tshuva. All of the different things that have happened throughout the last few years did not change tshuva. Now, of course, there are people out there that send, uh, anytime there is disaster strikes, they send messages to people of how they found this by one of the sages. They said that if such and such happens, uh, this could be the, uh, the time of Mashiach. And let's, let's elaborate on that. Uh, in the name of the Gaomi Vilna, it was uh, sent, and again, I didn't double check this, but I, I, let's assume it's all true. Uh, the Gaomi Vilna, in essence, said that when there is a, uh, a going to be a fight between Ukraine and Russia, apparently this is going to be a, uh, something that happens before Mashiach comes. Uh, so much so that some righteous people say that they are uh, putting on their Mashiach clothes, their, uh, their clothes of Shabbat. In uh, welcoming the king. Now, these types of things have happened throughout all of history. This is not uh, uh, something that's new. It's important to know that the sages, uh, you know, the, the, that dealt with both the traditional Torah that we deal with on a day to day basis, as well as the mystical, supernatural, things that are above and beyond our pay grade. They understood certain things that are happening in Shemaim that, uh, you know, warrant certain things to happen. So each one of them that made statements about how the Mashiach is, you know, could come at a specific time. Uh, it's not that they lied and it's not that they spoke out of uh, context. It's that they actually saw something that this is a real possibility and even a likelihood if certain things happen, if certain things uh, happen, this would warrant it. So, of course, the, uh, the event that they mentioned is not the only thing. There are other things that, you know, people need to read the rest of their books where they say you have to do tshuva, you have to, uh, you know, uh, fix a lot of different things. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want to send the Mashiach to a generation of immoral people. As the Gemara says that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, who is the Goel, He's the Mashiach. He's not coming to a generation of Batlanim, people that don't learn Torah. So when we fix ourselves with the immorality, when we fix ourselves with our uh, wasting time and not learning Torah, when we fix ourselves with, with Tshuva, then of course we're putting ourselves in a better position for the Mashiach to come. But for whatever reason or another, it's become very uh, popular over the last few years where uh, people have uh, decided that Mashiach now is really the best thing that you should preach to people, not knowing an inkling of what that actually means. Anyone that uh, has learned the topic of Mashiach knows that Mashiach, yes, although that is the climatic event for the existence of this world, but it's not coming for free. It's not coming without certain ramifications, meaning that all of the people that are screaming Mashiach and, and that Mashiach is going to come, for whatever reason or another, maybe they think that Mashiach is going to pay off their debt, is going to, you know, it's going to fix their teeth, is maybe, you know, fix their marriage, make their kids smart. I don't know. People think that Mashiach is like a social security office slash, uh, you know, some type of uh, 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 magic worker that is going to fix all of their problems. This is not what Mashiach is going to do. Mashiach is going to fight the wars of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, wars that unfortunately people uh, don't want to fight, especially in the rabbinical world. Apparently fighting has become a, a sin, uh, especially fighting for the sake of the Torah. Uh, and Mashiach is going to fight these wars, going to fight the uh, different enemies of Am Yisrael, some of them being the, uh, the Amalek from the Gentile world and uh, some of them coming from the Jewish world. Also Amalek, such as the government of Israel and, uh, and different wicked rabbis that are Erev Rav. 
uh, these are some of the wars that Mashiach is going to fight. But if anybody reads some of the prophecies that uh, the prophet Zechariah says in chapter 14 or Yechezkel says uh, in chapter 38, there's going to be a massive war where a lot of people are going to die. Two-thirds of the world is going to die instantly, and one-third is going to be uh, refined like, uh, like gold and, uh, and silver, meaning that even the last third is not necessarily guaranteed life, and this is o- life is only going to be for those people that have completed their tshuva, for those people that have done everything within their power to serve Hashem at the best possible way they can, meaning that regardless of whether this war in, uh, in Russia and in Ukraine is the beginning of Gogu Magog or it's just another step towards Gogu Magog because some believe that Gogu Magog already started years ago uh, or it's not, our position has not changed. Our obligation has not changed. We all have to do tshuva, serve our creator to the best of our abilities and not worry so much about hiding because there will, if this is the last war, there is no hiding. There is no place on earth that's going to be safe. Not Israel, not America, not Russia, certainly not Ukraine and not anywhere else in the world. Why? Because if this is the end, it's the, the, the last part of it is going to be much worse than World War II, uh, much war, worse than the Holocaust, and the reality is that anyone that studied a little bit about what happened during the Holocaust understands that much worse than that is beyond human comprehension. The point being is that anyone that has an inkling of understanding of what would transpire at the time of Mashiach knows that the only thing they can rely on is, as the Gemara in Masichet Sota, page 49b says, En al milismoch ela el avinu There's nothing for us to rely on other than our Father in Heaven, meaning that regardless of where you are in the world physically, all you can rely on is your Father in Heaven. But you can't rely on your Father in Heaven if your Father in Heaven couldn't rely on you while you were in this world, you know, uh, uh, focusing on Bitcoins and websites and buying uh, second and third cars and houses. If you were in this world serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu to the utmost power that you have, then yes, you can rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, will protect you regardless of what hole in the world you're positioned in. If not, then there's really no, uh, you should be reading Tehilim for Mashiach not to come. That's the reality. So I know that the, uh, the Chabad movement of seeing Mashiach now has simply uh, 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 made the whole issue of Mashiach completely the opposite of what it really is. But anyone that studies the subject knows that if Mashiach is not going to come from good, he's going to come from bad. And for him to come from good, the majority of Am Yisrael has to do tshuva. Anyone that knows the statistics knows that we're not even close to that. At best, we're 20% of Am Yisrael have actually are actually keeping Shabbat. And that's 20% keeping Shabbat doesn't necessarily mean, you know, everybody has done tshuva. Every one of us has to do tshuva. So the point being here is that instead of focusing so much about whether this is the end or this is not, we should use every single event that happens in the world, whether it's a war, it's corona, or it's financial crisis, or it's good things, every one of those events as a, another way for us to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and push ourselves further to serve Hashem. Not worry about where we're living, not worry about what, uh, 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 how much money we have in the bank, and if we've saved enough, None of that stuff is going to matter. What's only thing is going to matter is how does the, your mitzvah account and your chesed account, how does that account look? How much chesed have you done to help people do tshuva? How, much, how many mitzvot have you done just this morning? What did you do? And this is really one of the things that people need to know because there is simply a, uh, a cloud that's blinding people, making them think that if this is the end, then uh, maybe I should move somewhere, maybe I should start selling everything, all, all types of erratic, insane things. And a lot of people say, yeah, but you know, during the Holocaust, people didn't move, and look what happened to them. Yeah, the Holocaust wasn't the end. The Holocaust was a decree that was part of the end, and those that Kadosh uh, decided they're going to live, live. Those that Hashem decided they're not going to live, didn't live, regardless of where they're going to live. It wasn't due to their living situation, that uh, they survived or they died. Proof of that is simply Holocaust survivors, people that actually went to Auschwitz, 
people actually went through the gas chambers themselves and still are alive to tell the story. So they couldn't be at a worse place, yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided they're not going to die. The, uh, the uh, Kozenberger Rebbe, the, his whole family, wife and ten kids, all got murdered in cold blood, yet he not only lived, but prospered as a result of what happened in, in the Holocaust, and he ended up building an entire empire of Tzans, Hasidei Tzans, have uh, the Kozenberger Rebbe's suffering to thank for that, uh, that he built this huge Hasidut full of Kedusha. Now, of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, the Kozenberger Rebbe understood the ramifications of the decree, cried over it endlessly, but it didn't stop him from moving. He lived where he lived, he, uh, uh, he built where he built, he did whatever he could when he could. And that's really what the lesson is to all of us. We have to do whatever we can to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, regardless of where we are. We have to look at our situation, where we're at, and, and use that situation Use those circumstances to serve Hashem the best we possibly can. If you think you can serve Hashem better by living somewhere else, and you can live somewhere else, by all means, go for it. Whether that's in Israel, or it's in America, or it's in England, or it's wherever it is, you think you can serve Hashem better by going somewhere else, and you can actually go somewhere else, by all means, go do it. But if you think that you'll be safer by living somewhere else, then perhaps you should spend more time learning Torah, because there's no source for that. There's no source for that, especially when it comes to a Sha'at Ashmad, which is an hour of destruction. So again, the situation in the world is not good, it's horrendous, but it's not necessarily uh, that much different than it was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, or before that. Situation is, has been horrendous for several years already. It's just that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is just simply trying to send different signs because different signs work for different people. Some people were motivated to start serving Hashem as a result of a virus that everyone thought everyone's going to die. Some people were, uh, you know, realized that the world is full of lies with all the doctors and the politicians. One is pushing, one is pulling all of this vaccine stuff. People decided to get closer to Hashem as a result of that. Some people were already concerned before that with the anti-Semitism that uh, was, uh, was uh, running rampant. Uh, before uh, uh, coronavirus. Some people are more uh, receptive to war. Hashem is using every single thing before He closes the store. And that's really the point of everything. Before a person closes down his shop, he wants to collect whatever he can. And I'll give you a story that I told somebody else last week, a story that I said a couple of times in the past, but a story that will summarize this whole point once and for all for everybody. Years ago, many years ago, over 30 years ago, when I was a kid still growing in, uh, in, in Israel, there used to be this, uh, this guy named Rafi. Rafi owned a deli, a uh, very small little deli, and over there is where we do our shopping. My mom, God bless her, she would send us over there to get whatever we needed to get. And how could she send... You know, a uh, young kids, I mean, a, uh, we're talking about 35, 40 years ago, send a you know, four or five year old, six year old kid to go get some Coca Cola or some cookies or whatever it is because I didn't need to have money. I go to Rafi, I take whatever I took, I tell Rafi this is what I'm taking. Rafi writes it in his little notebook and I go home carrying the stuff, walking a mile all the way to the house, and Ima, here you go, I got the stuff. What about the money? Rafi had a notebook. He had a notebook where my mom and many of his other customers would simply keep a tab. Keep a tab. And, Baruch Hashem, even after we left uh, Eretz Yisrael, my very honest mom, who taught us honesty along with my father, always taught us honesty regardless of how religious we were. We always had integrity in our house. When we left Eretz Yisrael, she made sure that every single month, every single month, she would send a check to Rafi to pay off the entire tab until every single penny was, uh, was paid. Now, Rafi was one of the old generation where you could keep a tab. I'm not really sure if you could still do that with other places in the world today, at least not in America. I don't think you could go to a, uh, a Walgreens or a Walmart and say, keep me a tab, but let's just imagine you can. Now, one day, that tab has to be paid. Arabi again, Allah Shalom says that if the guy that owns the store decides to close the store a month before, two months before he closes the store, he stops taking on new debt. 
People want to buy more stuff on the tab. He says, I'm sorry, no more. Well, why not? I mean, I have a tab here for 20 years. I understand, but no more. In fact, you got to start paying back. Why? Well, why? What happened? I'm closing down shop. I'm closing down the shop. That's the story. Closing down the shop, everybody's got to pay. And that's the reality that we have in the world today. Akadosh Baruch Hu is closing down the store. So before he closes down the store, he gives us all types of signs. He's giving us all types of signs, whether it's anti-Semitism, whether it's our friends becoming enemies, whether it's the government turning into a government of heretics, whether it's a, uh, the uh, different signs that the Gemara says are going to happen before the Mashiach comes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending us those signs. Those signs are not for you to go crazy over. Those signs are not for you to think that you can move to Greece on some beach and maybe that's going to help you. Those signs are simply to give you a warning it's time to do tshuva. Regardless of where you stand in life, it's time to do tshuva. Start fixing stuff. Start fixing more. Learn more. Do more. Why? Because once the Mashiach comes, there's no more tshuva. There's no more tshuva. And that's the reality. Why? Because once Mashiach comes, there's not going to be any, uh, any free choice to the same extent as we have right now. So it's very important for a person to know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is closing the store. He's doing whatever he can to give us as many signs as possible so we still have free choice to make the right choice, but we can still make the wrong choice, Chas Shalom. Hence the reason of why we're doing what we're doing. Whether the Mashiach is going to come in a week, in a month, in 20 years, no one knows. But there are auspicious times that the sages have told us throughout the generations of things that would transpire that would make that particular time an auspicious time. Whether it's uh, times during the holiday, Shavuot, Pesach, uh, or it's uh, specific events that would happen in the world. All types of things, all types of signs that this is another sign. This is another time. There's no guarantee that this would happen at that time. But nonetheless, this is the reason why the Rambam, Paskin L'Alecha in his, uh, in his uh, Yad Chazaka, that a person that calculates the time specifically and tells people Mashiach is coming on such and such date is cursed from Shemaim. Cursed from Shemaim. Why cursed from Shemaim? Because you are going to weaken much more than you strengthen. Because more times than not, you're going to be wrong on such guesses. A lot of people are saying, listen, put on your Shabbat clothes, Mashiach is coming any minute. This is not a good idea. This is not a good idea. Why? Because, first and foremost, your clothes are not going to help you with Mashiach. I promise you. Your clothes are definitely not going to help you with Mashiach. Tshuva is going to help you. Your spiritual clothes are going to help you. But actual real clothes, that's not going to help you. You go and buy a five, ten thousand dollars dress, it's not going to help you. Most likely, you're going to get punished for it because you could have used that money to help people do tshuva and a lot of other good things. Most likely, the dress is not even modest if you're spending that kind of money. The reality is a person needs to understand when it comes to Mashiach, tshuva is the only thing that matters. Tshuva is the only thing that matters. Repenting for our sins, saying, I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, fixing our ways and learning more and more about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and also getting other people to join us. That's the most critical thing that a person needs to do at these times. Not worry about all of the mumbo jumbo that's in the news because all of that stuff is, we already know, it's all the same. Corona, virus, the uh, vaccine, the uh, financial crisis, financial uh, uh, escalation, whatever, all of those things, they're all the same. They're all simply signs from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's like a light. Red, 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 green, 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 yellow, 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 blue, 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 whatever color, color, color you want, 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 want. Just get it as a sign through your skull, 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 skull. Get it. That's what it is. That's all it is. It's all signs from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Do tshuva. Whatever works for you, whatever works for your neighbor, whatever works for your cousin, whatever works for your mother, whatever works, just get people to wake up. As far as when Mashiach is going to come, no one knows. And people that tell you Mashiach is coming this year, they're liars. Simple. Never listen to them again. Why? Simple. They're going against a psak halacha. They're not allowed to do such things. And it's not my halacha. It's the Rambam's halacha. And that's the halacha that Klal Yisrael holds by. You're never going to see a Gdol You're never going to see a uh, Rav Kanievsky or a uh, Rav Ovadia or anybody else saying, Oh, Mashiach is coming this week. You're never going to see that. You're going to say that it's an auspicious time for him to come, perhaps, uh, you know, this uh, this time of the year or things like that. But they're, not going to, they're never going to give you a specific time. People like that usually are motivated by something that's corrupt, which brings us to the point that we want to talk about in regards to the Chazonish. You see, Rabotai, we have 
corruption, corruption everywhere. And if we do not know the, how to deal with corruption, what is the Torah's opinion about corruption? We may fall for it ourselves, chas v'shalom, and it's important for us to know how HaKadosh Baruch Hu views corruption, corruption of our own logic as far as what the law is and what it's not, corruption of what happens in a bed din, corruption of what happens in a bit knesset, corruption of what happens as a nation, psak halacha, corruption when it comes to fighting against evil, corruption against fighting good. There's corruption everywhere. And it's important for us to know what is the Torah's perspective of corruption. Now, in this week's parasha, of course, everything is connected to the parasha, as usual. Parashat Pikudei says, Ele Pikudei HaMishka, Mishkan HaEdut, Asher Pukad Al Pi, Moshe, Avodat HaLevim, Biyad Etamar, Ben Aaron HaKohen, Ubezalel Ben Uri, Ben Chur, Lemate Yehuda Asa, Et Kol Asher Tziva, Adonai Et Moshe, Vito Aliyah Ben Achisamach, Lemate Dan, Harash Vachoshev, Verokem Betchelet Bargaman, Ubetolat HaShani Yubashesh, these are the reckonings of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, which were reckoned at Moshe's bidding. The labor of the Levites was under the authority of Itamar, son of Aaron the Kohen, Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Ho, uh, her, uh, of the tribe of Yehuda, did everything that Hashem commanded Moshe. With him was Aliav, son of Achisamach, of the tribe of Dan, a carver, a weaver, Embroider with turquoise, purple, scarlet wool, and with linen. All these wonderful things. Why do I need to know all of this? Am I going to build a bit of Mikdash right now? Perhaps tomorrow Mashiach comes. But we're all kidding aside. Oh, no kidding aside. What do I need to know all of this stuff? Why do I need to know all of these different things? Chachamim tell us it's critical. Critical for you to know all of these things. Critical for you to know all these things for countless different reasons. One of the reasons is to make sure that you understand. Moshe Rabbeinu was not alone. Moshe Rabbeinu was not alone. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave special wisdom and kedusha to specific people. Of course, we already know Aaron HaKohen, his brother and his sons, they all got the keuna. But he also gave special wisdom to Bezalel, to Aliyav. These special people, and also people that work for them, these people had extraordinary wisdom. Wisdom from Shemaim, unlike any other. And therefore, there were four keys to the success of building a tabernacle that was, in essence, the Bet HaMikdash that was never destroyed. The first and second Bet HaMikdash that were built many years later were destroyed. Buildings huge rocks anyone that goes to the kotel sees that some of these rocks are 40 feet long huge enormous rocks scientists and uh, and, 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 and and experts have no idea how am israel was able to move these rocks and position them wherever they wanted when the technology to move such rocks doesn't even exist today so am israel obviously had extraordinary wisdom wisdom that is unlike any other, including, un, you know, doesn't exist in the world today. And Am Yisrael moved these rocks, did all these wonderful things. But yet in the end, those two Batei Mikdash, one that was around for 410 years, then the second one that was 70 years later was around for 420 years, a total of 900 years. Both were destroyed because of our sins. But this first Batei Mikdash, this tabernacle in a desert, that's not made of rocks, it's made of different animal skins and special poles and all types of things that obviously are not as strong as the huge 40 uh, uh, feet long rocks was never destroyed. Despite the wars they fought, despite the 40 years of moving from place to place, never destroyed. This means that this tabernacle had a special siyat dishmaya special assistance from heaven to be indestructible it's the only one of the batei mikdash if you will that was never destroyed even though it went through a lot and never got destroyed why would the, why did they have why did it have such a success so the beginning of this parasha tells us a little bit of a hint of why there was success here first you have to know that we had a kadosh baruch Hu with us we were righteous. We were following the Torah. We were committed. We also had our leader, 
our Goel, Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu was with us, the prophet of all prophets, Isha Elohim, the man of God. Aside from that, we, as, you know, aside from that extraordinary leader, we had the Levites. We had the Levites, we had the Tzadikim, as the Pasuk says, that these Levites, these Levim, were holy people that uh, in them had, of course, the, uh, the Kohanim, Aaron Kohen, his sons. But in addition to that, in addition to having all of these special people, having the wisdom of, uh, of uh, Bezalel and all of these people, we have something that is very interesting. HaKadosh Baruch Hu specifies all of these intricate things that we need to have to build the tabernacle. All of these skills, but also all of these materials, the wool, the stone, the gold, the silver, the copper, all of these things. And in last week's parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu told Am Yisrael, enough, don't give me any more. It's like a, imagine somebody having a campaign and they're raising money. And then they say, you know what, guys, you already donated too much. Stop donating. You ever hear such a thing happen? No, it doesn't happen. You know what happens once a campaign reaches its goal? What do they tell you today? Bonus round. Wait, but you were looking for a million. You got a million. So why don't you say stop? No, we're going to go for bonus round. Let's push for another 100,000. But you said you needed a million. If you needed 1.1 million, you should have said 1.1 million. No, no, we need 1 million. But if you're already giving, you're in the mood of giving. Why stop people from giving? Give more. You raise 2 million. Bonus round. They raise more. Why? Who's going to say to stop? Moshe Rabbeinu said to stop. Why? We have instructions. And we're going to follow those instructions. What about bonus round? There is no bonus round. Why? We want everyone to know. We're not going to benefit out of this. You're not giving me the wool. You're not giving me the money, the gold. The, uh, the, you're not giving it to me. You're giving it for yourself. You are contributing for yourself. For yourself. I don't need any of it. So the second we have what we need, that's it. We don't need a penny more. A penny more we don't need. And Moshe Rabbeinu knew exactly what we need, of course, talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu on a regular basis. How is he not going to know? But here we see the honesty and integrity behind the building of the Bet HaMikdash. Who built it? Who's behind all of it? And how honest they were. When you have honesty and integrity, you're assured success. And it's important for a person to know that in the world that we live in today, there's a reason. Why our sages call this world Alma de Shikha, the world of lies. World of lies because honesty and integrity is hard to find. I have lived a decent life, Ishtabach Shimo, hopefully many more years to help people do tshuva are still left. And I can assure you that in my over 20 years of doing business on Wall Street and different things in different fields, I've dealt with thousands of people, thousands among thousands of people before I ever dealt with people in the Torah world. And I have yet to find a single person to this day, to this day, yet to find a single person to this day that I can tell you that's an honest business person. You will see people that they do good here, but they cheat there. They do bad from the start or they do good and then they cheat or they they, or they say one thing, but in reality, it's something else. Or they don't have a word. They tell you they'll do one thing, but they don't do it. Or they just simply change it. This has become standard. Corruption, lies have become standard. It's unfortunate. And of course, everyone that's in the business world is taking offense to this. Then take offense to it. Good you're taking offense to it because that means you may actually be a straight person. You know who's not taking offense to it? People that are liars because they know they're one of them. The contractor that told this guy... That, listen, I'm going to finish the job in two months. Six months later, he still hasn't showed up to f- finish the second half because he already got paid. You know who's not offended? The lawyer that tells you, listen, all I need is a $10,000 retainer. I'll take care of the case. The second that he runs out of the $10,000, he tells you, listen, this is a lot more difficult than I thought. I'm going to need at least another $25,000. And you don't even know what to do because you already paid the guy 10000 
Now he wants another 25,000. Had he told you he's going to need 35,000, you would have thought twice before you actually had him take the case. But this has become normal. People are corrupt on a regular basis. And even today, they've corrupted corruption to such an extent that they've made corruption something that you aspire to do in the world. They call it hustling. They call it hustling. Oh, he's just hustling. What do you mean? He's cheating his customers? No, no, he's not cheating. He's just, you know, he's hustling like everybody else. Oh, you mean he's lying to them? No, 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 he's not lying to them. I mean, they, they know. How do they know if he told them that it's this and it's something else? Well, they should know. He's just hustling like everybody else. Oh, so you mean that he's misleading them? Well, I don't know if you want to say that. Well, he's misspeaking, right? Well, yeah, I guess he's not saying 100%. Oh, so he's a liar. No, I don't know. Nobody wants to admit it, but that's the reality. People are corrupt. Why? Lack of fear of the Almighty. They believe that God is in a bit Knesset. They believe that God is somewhere else. But when it comes to business, very few people actually believe that God is there watching their transaction. And unfortunately, Abutai, this even happens in the Jewish world in a Beddin. How do I know it happens in a Beddin? It's mentioned in the Torah. If it's mentioned in the Torah, surely it happens. Now, of course, this is not to accuse anyone. It's just a reality. Hence the reason of why the Chazonish brings it. Why the Chazonish brings it to warn us about this corruption. Corruption that is in all forms and all sizes. And of course, one of the ways to express to, to, uh, to have corrupt uh, behavior is with bribery. Now, last week, we talked about how Akadosh Baruch Hu hates bribery. It says that bribery is a, uh, the Chazuni says that bribery is a very special thing in a sense that bribery is a, has a special power. The impurity that comes from bribery has a special power unlike other sins, unlike other misbehaviors. Where taking bribes is an absolutely condemned action and the Torah views it as an abomination, abomination just like bestiality, abomination just like arrogance, abomination, just like homosexuality, abomination, just like distorting the Torah on purpose, abomination, such as befriending and inviting missionaries to a synagogue or telling the people that God needs you. All types of abominable acts. Bribery is one of those abominable acts. At the root of it, is one of the most is one of the mysteries of the power of human nature where bribery blinds the wise and causes them to pervert judgment and since it said in the holy uh, in, since it said that the holy one blessed is he looked into the torah and created the world according to the torah the torah itself created a reality that bribery has a power to blind and distort and the torah warns us to avoid it so up to now the Chazonish tells us that bribery is not like other things. Bribery in itself is something that is like gravity, something like it's all the other, you know, physics that are out there, all of the other physical things that are out there that people are aware of. Bribery is also one of the physical forces out there where it's written in the Torah that bribery blinds the wise and therefore that's how a Kadosh who created the world, meaning that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how you know. The second you get bribed or the second you bribe somebody, there is a consequence, a horrible one. It's never a good one. It's never a good consequence as a result of, 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 of this bribery. Now, of course, the, uh, there are different times that I explained last week. There are times that, uh, you know, the bad needs to be used for good, such as bribing in order to uh, save a person's life. Uh, you have a Jew that's a prisoner of, let's say, some uh, Amalek's uh, uh, prison, and you bribe somebody to release them. Of course, you're using the, uh, the the bad for good purposes, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about bribery in a day-to-day -day life, normal circumstances, not exceptional circumstances, and those briberies lead to bad. Why? Because Akadosh Baruch Hu, when he created the world, he looked at a blueprint, the blueprint that he created, which is the Torah. And since the Torah stated that bribery blinds the wise, therefore bribery blinds the wise. Meaning that this is not something that, the, uh, uh, that you can escape. This is not something 
that you could uh, ignore, but rather this is a reality. A reality that uh, perhaps a person, if, if they're not aware of it, they can literally become a victim of it because it's not that a, uh, this bribery, uh, the Chazoni says, it's not that this bribery is something that could potentially happen, but rather this is a reality that is happening. Meaning he's not telling you the possibilities, he's dictating the realities. That's in essence the difference between uh, what we think is bad and what is uh, actually bad. Now, to continue, the Chazonish continues and says the following. The power of personal interest is part of the way of the world. The nature of human beings. But bribery has an additional power of impurity that seals the heart and anesthetizes the mind making it actually pleasant for the judge to acquit the briber. The Torah prohibit, prohibited a bribed judge from judging a case between his briber and a fellow Jew. If he does attempt to do so, the protective shroud of wisdom that the judge has been promised from above so as to save him from error and sin is removed from him. This is the section we're going to elaborate on today, Be'ezot Hashem, and see how this affects our lives. So first, the Chazanish tells us that this power, that this bribery has, is not just something that a person can bribe themselves because their own desires, they are, you know, in essence, uh, they have a, uh, uh, um, a certain desire, and that desire is, in essence, bribing them themselves and their own flaws and so on, like we talked about last week. But rather, simple, traditional bribe. You're sitting in a uh, Bedin as a judge, or you are one of the people that is coming to a Bedin because you are suing someone or someone is suing you. And a bribe is involved. Okay? Simple, traditional case. The Chazoni says that the power of the personal interest of each person is not something that anyone is going to debate here. It's part of human nature. But bribery... Bribery in itself is a separate power. It has a separate power of impurity that takes whatever normal circumstances you are in, normal circumstances the judge is in, normal circumstances that thought processes and so on that exist without the bribe and changes them without you doing anything other than having a exchange of bribe. Now, of course, a bribe comes in different forms. Sometimes a bribe comes in obvious money. Sometimes the bribe comes in favors. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. You help me up here, I'll get you a job there. You do this for me, and this happens, uh, unfortunately, a lot in politics. Politics, which I believe comes from the, uh, the uh, root of the word is in Greek, comes from uh, some bloodsucker. This is part of the reason. They, uh, the, the job of a politician is to know how to suck as much blood as possible from any connection that he has. Hence the reason of why politics don't refrain from doing business with their enemies. They don't refrain. They don't disconnect from them. They talk to their enemies on a regular basis. Perhaps they can become friends in one way and enemies in another way. And it's a very strange world, nonetheless, full of corruption. But here we see that the Chazonish is telling us that this be strange behavior is not something that is just happening to him because he's a politician. It could happen to him even if he was a plumber. It could happen to him if he, even if he was a builder. It could happen to him even if he was a rabbi. It could happen to him even if he was a, a regular student that goes to, uh, you know, to university. It happens to anyone. As soon as a bribe is involved, normal circumstances change. How do they change? The heart is suddenly sealed, says the Chazanish. What does it mean? Heart is sealed? All of a sudden... The guy that is always emotional, the guy that's always passionate, becomes cold like ice. 
How so? He sees the facts, not in accordance to reality, but in accordance to where the bribe is. In the past, he could have been extremely passionate about something. Very passionate, screaming about it, telling people about it, doing whatever it is. But all of a sudden, a bribe came, and all of a sudden you ask him, so, so what's going on? Nothing, it's not my business anymore. What, what do you mean it's not your business? You've been talking about it for five years. Yeah, you know, you talk about it, it didn't work, and that's it, I moved on with my life. Yeah, but now is the time you need to do something. No, nah, no, nah, it's not for me anymore. All of a sudden, completely nonchalant, as if the last five years don't exist. Sometimes you'll see that in people where they'll study. They'll study Chosh and Mishpat. They'll become experts in, in business and in, in, in dealings of uh, all kinds in the Jewish world. But the second there's some type of bribe involved, whether it's a bribe because they have an interest themselves, it's their deal, and someone is on the opposite end disagreeing with them, or it's their, uh, somebody connected to them in some way, uh, a son, a daughter, uh, a friend, whoever it is, and in essence, there is a bias. That bias in itself becomes a bribe. That bias becomes a bribe, and all of a sudden, all of the knowledge and expertise and righteousness and honesty and integrity that they've been preaching and studying and dedicating their whole life to, all of a sudden, they can't see right from left. They only see their own, uh, their own baby is right. Their son is right. Their cousin is right. Their Talmud is right. Yeah, but it's clear that the other side also has a case. I don't know what they're talking about. It's clear to me that he's right. So you see here that the bias shuts down the emotions. Those emotions, many times, are things that lead people to do certain things. The bribe shuts that off. Why? The second there is a bribe, as the Gemara in Masechet Ketubot says, it's called shochad, kechad, because they became echad. They, it's called uh, a bribe is called shochad because the two people that exchanged bribes became echad became one they both have the same opinion they both have the same opinion now, all of a sudden until now they could have been virtually enemies about every single thing under the sun but the second that a bribe exchanged hands that's it they have a universe a, a unified opinion as if they were siamese twins as if they were perfect twins, they don't even have separate thoughts. Second thing that it does, it is the mind of the person goes uh, under anesthesia, says the Chazonish. It goes under anesthesia. That's it. It does not develop. It's no longer open to any new ideas. It's like sleeping. Whatever it had at the moment that the bribe was given with the instructions that the, come along with the bribe that's it yeah but i have new information i have new facts to show you look they did this 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 and this i don't know how you see that i don't know what do you mean but you're a smart guy you're a smart woman you've been studying the subject for 20 30 years tell me if they, tell me how you don't see it they don't see it they don't see it and i've seen this with my own eyes how bribes literally make people completely different than what they are in their day-to-day -day life completely different than they are in their day-to-day -day life this i saw a lot on wall street when there was different people that had the uh, uh, uh a different agenda than what they should have had people that were uh simply a uh, on a uh, uh on a path to destroy whatever they could even if that meant it would destroy the people that helped them their whole life. They're on that path. They had an agenda. So that mind that was constantly developing, constantly welcoming new ideas, constantly, uh, you know, uh, honest and with, uh, with some integrity behind it, all of a sudden goes under anesthesia. S to what extent is this? The Chazonish says, so much so that it develops a new desire making it actually pleasant for the judge to acquit the briber here the chazoni says something profound he says that typically 
typically, everybody has their desires. Their desires. Some people, they desire a, uh, intimacy. Some people desire food. Some people desire honor. Some people desire whatever. People desire all types of stuff. He says the bribe is so powerful. The impurity, the tum'ah that comes from the bribe is so powerful that it actually creates a new desire in the person that was bribed. A desire that does not exist any other time. Any other time he may have a desire to have a cream cheese uh, sandwich or a uh, cheesecake or a, I don't know, a peanut butter and jelly or, uh, you know, I don't know, five wives or uh, whatever, another five buildings. He has all types of desires like the rest of society. The second he got bribed, Chazoni says he now has a unique desire for the time. What is that desire? A desire was born to please his briber. This is something profound when you really truly understand it. That any other time in your life, you can look at this person that bribed you, before he bribed you, and perhaps not even like the guy, care less for him, or in fact hate him so much that you want to bust his chops, make fun of him, call him names, steal stuff from him, do all types of things. Why? Care less for the guy. Or you like the guy, but at best, maybe you'll invite him to your kid's bar mitzvah. That's it. You're not doing more. You're not doing less. You're not uh, going to do anything more than him. You're not going to go out of your way to please him. If he asks you for a ride, you're only going to give it to him if he's on the direction that you're going. Uh, to the, you know, you're simply not looking to do anything extra for the person. And in fact, even if it's a third circumstance, you like the guy. He's your friend. He's your buddy. But that even has a limit. You'll invite him to the bar mitzvah and maybe even the wedding too. You'll invite him for a Shabbos once in a while. If somebody needs his business, you'll refer him if you remember. And nobody else is paying you any money under the table. But the second he bribes you, all bets are off. Why? You now have a new desire. A desire that would be relevant to all of those parties I just listed. The one that you hate, the one that's so-so, and the one that you like. The bribe makes all of them the same. Suddenly, they all become somebody that you have a desire to please. Because of that bribe, all of a sudden, you have a desire to call them and tell them how things are going. In the past, you wouldn't even call them if you just found out they came out of the hospital. But now, you want to let them know, listen, we had the court case today. We're doing really well. So you have nothing to worry about. Oh, okay, thanks. Appreciate that. Thanks for letting me know that everything is okay. In the past, you wouldn't even call the guy. But now, you want to call him, make him feel okay. Hey, listen, I just felt like you should stop by your house. Oh, wow, why are you stopping by my house? Now I want to let you know that we're doing good. Oh, you can't, don't you live like two hours from here? Yeah, yeah, but I figured I should give you the message face to face, you know? I wanted to give you face to face. You want to drive two hours to go tell them everything's okay. Why? New desire. A desire you don't even know how to cope with. You've never had such a thing. You've never had such a thing. you never heard such a thing. There's nothing written about it. There's no self-help book that's going to tell you, listen, how to overcome the feelings of, uh, of uh, desire to, uh, for somebody that bribed you. Until the Chazonish brought it to the world, most people didn't even realize this stuff exists. But that's a reality. It's a desire that is, lives during the time of the bribe. The second the bribe is gone, the feeling most likely will be gone. But during that time, the only thing I can compare it to is perhaps the desire that people have for lust. Where people that have not learned enough to lie and apply it in their life, obviously don't know how to control themselves. Any day. But everyone understands, regardless of whether they're the ones that know how to control themselves or don't know how to control themselves, 
everyone understands that moment where there's an extraordinary amount of heat and they don't even know what to do with themselves. They just come out of some sick dream or whatever they saw, or whatever it is, even if it's for their own wife. They have this lust or it's for their own husband. They have this lust that's uncontrollable. They, they simply are uh, almost going to eat people if they have to. That lust that's completely out of control, that hopefully is something that you could put under control if you understand what I mean, um, guess what? That's a very similar desire to what the Chazonish is talking about that a person would have as a result of a bribe. As a result of a bribe, you just got bribed, you're going to have a lust to please this other person. Not in such a fashion, but in a different fashion. Now, this is part of the reason of why it's an abomination. It almost turns the person that bribed you into an idol. It almost turns a person into an idol because a person that was bribed enough literally is uh, going to start doing everything possible for that person, even if that means continuing to desecrate Hashem's name in every way, shape, or form. Hence the reason of why the Chazanish is saying that the T- Torah prohibited the bribed judge from judging on a case between his briber and a fellow Jew. And if he does attempt to do so, the protective shroud of wisdom that the judge was promised from above will be removed. What is this protective uh, um, protective shroud of wisdom? What, are they, what is the Chazonish really talking about? What is the Chazonish talking about when it comes to this protective uh, uh, shroud? Now, it's important to know that to be a Dayan in a Bed-Din is a very, very big responsibility. How big? The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that a Dayan that follows the Torah, not just in his personal life, of course, but in his, his judgments in the Bedin, in the Jewish judicial court, are in accordance to the Torah, becomes partners with Akadosh Baruch Hu in creation. Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, page 10a. Further, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 7a, says that a Dayan, the judges Am Yisrael, according to the Torah, brings the Shechina, brings the Shechina down to protect himself and Am Yisrael. Such is the power of righteous judgment. Once, a uh, Rav Avadia told his grandson, I have an offer for you. He said, his, his grandson, Rav Abutbul, says, yes, ma, ma, what's the offer? He says, you want to become partners with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in creation? Sure, what, what do I have to do? He says, go study to become a Dayan. Study to become a Dayan. Once you become a Dayan, you follow the Torah, you do what the Torah says, you become a partner with HaKadosh Baruch in creation. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that. You're partners with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, and something happens. You say, something happens. It's a big deal. Now, because of this extraordinary partnership, of a righteous judge and a Kadosh Baruch Hu, because in essence this righteous judge enforces a Kadosh Baruch Hu's law, not enforcing his own law, he's not enforcing his own opinion. Because of this extraordinary partnership, there is a decree from Shemaim. What is this decree? Because you are coming to do the righteous thing to fulfill my Torah. In day-to-day lives of people, in their business uh, problems, marriage problems, conversion, all of these different things, you're looking to fulfill my word. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to give you a special siyata dishmaya that you're not going to be wrong. That your judgments are going to be the correct judgments. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu 
operates his world with measure for measure. The principle of measure for measure is well known, typically in punishments and so on, but also in day-to-day life. How so? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu operates his world with the measure for measure, his signature of emet, emet being the truth, that everything that is connected to Hashem is always true, that emet now becomes the shield, the protective shield around this dayan. Because you came to bring my truth to Am Yisrael, I'm going to have that very same truth protect you. Meaning that you will always find and know the right answer. You'll give the right answer. You'll pass the right judgment. Because you came and put your ishtadlut, your effort to fulfill the law. I'll make sure that the way you're fulfilling it is the right way. So there's a special shroud that's protecting the Dayanim. There's a special shroud that's protecting Poskim. Special shroud that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has protecting these people, especially the, the ones that are actually uh, not just studying the law, but actually are judging it itself. Now, this only exists if they are committed to the truth of the Torah. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like I said, he operates the world with measure for measure. Now, the Sefer HaChinuch, Sefer HaChinuch from maybe 800 years ago, he has a extraordinary explanations. Extraordinary explanations about each and every single mitzvah course this is no exception but there is even before the mitzvah of uh, bribery it's worth it for us to delve into what he says about the different prohibitions regarding judges dayanim and mitzvah number 77 is the prohibition upon a dayan a judge to argue for a conviction in a capital case after having first argued for the acquittal this is based on the verse in exodus chapter 23 verse 2 do not declare your judicial opinion upon a grievance by veering to convict so here the sefer achinuch writes that we're commanded that one of the judges serving on a capital case may not in uh, casting his vote on the case simply follow the view of another great judge on the court or even follow the view of the majority based solely on his trust of the other judge or the majority the judge may not follow another whether it's to convict or to acquit the defendant by his vote unless the matter of conviction or the acquittal is understood by him with his own understanding and if the decision in this case hinges not upon a logical argument but upon interpretation of the law based on scriptural decree or a law derived by way of the uh, exegetical uh, uh, principle such as the it's required the judge himself know it and not rely upon nor trust one of the judges or even the majority of the court so here the Sefer HaChinuch tells us something extraordinary. That even someone that has studied Torah his whole life and is sitting in a bed dean, there's a capital case, someone is accused of committing crime that if convicted, they're going to get a capital punishment, a death penalty. They're sitting with two other judges. One of the judges is the biggest rabbi in the world. Let it be whoever you want. The biggest rabbi in the world. And you are one of the judges, and you're the smallest rabbi in the world. Obviously, you're Dayan, so you're bigger than the average rabbi out there, but in the judge in the Dayanut world, you're the smallest. He is the biggest. And whoever's in the middle is in the middle. Despite the difference, 
the world of difference between you and the biggest rabbi in the world that's sitting on the same bedin as you, you are forbidden from simply judging just the way he does without knowing the facts. Even if what he says makes a lot of sense, even if you know he has never been proven wrong, and any other excuse you have, not allowed to do such a thing. You cannot trust his integrity, his opinion, his anything. You have, if you're a judge, you have to do things based on your own understanding. Because this type of judgment, if you're just simply relying on, on somebody else, or you're even relying on the majority, the whole community knows he did it. But you have to look at the case for what it is. The majority of people say, oh, he did, he did, he did. Can't rely on it. Can't rely on it. You have to analyze things yourself. Because doing otherwise will pervert the justice. Further, the Rashi on the Pasuk says that many times you'll have circumstances where people in a normal, without the judgment, without there being a Bedin, you'll see that the large group of people are against something good. They start telling you, I don't know, something like, no, we're no longer supposed to rebuke people. Like this Rasha, Manus Friedman, wrote in his book, in his uh, Hebrew version of his book that uh, Rabbi Freim, Shichye, just uh, ripped apart in the last uh, couple of days through a couple of lectures after going through the book, literally ripped to shreds how the book is not fit to be in any Jewish library. In fact, it's not fit to be anywhere other than in a Gniza. And the only reason why it would be in Agniza is because there's a couple of verses that he copied from the Torah in there. But if it wasn't for those verses, Rabbi Flaim says you should put it in the garbage. That's where it belongs. Why? It's full of heresy. One after another, literally violating the 13 principles of faith, one after another. Creating a new, new religion, uh, everything, everything. Just literally just someone that is not allowed to be counted in the Minyan. Now this Rasha Manis, he says that the uh, this generation, everybody is clueless, everybody is Sinok Shanishba, everybody is a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, innocent because God owes us an apology for putting us through all the difficulties that we had in the last 2,000 years, things that we've said in the past already. And he adds, he adds in this, uh, in this book, uh, he adds uh, a few other tidbits, a few other uh, jewels, jewels of poison, where he tells people that uh, this, uh, this generation, you have to make sure, never under any condition, tell anybody what to do. Although, he says, although we have to care about all Jews, we have to make sure never to tell another Jew what to do. Taking the mitzvah from the Torah of Ocheach Tochiach et Amitecha, you must rebuke your fellow. It's a mitzvah from the Torah, it's not a suggestion. The mitzvah obligation that obligates you to rebuke your fellow. You see him about to drink poison, you see him about to jump in front of a moving train, you see him about to serve an idol, you see him about to desecrate Shabbat, you see him doing something wrong, you're warning him. Why? Because you love him. Mane says, no, 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 under no condition. Do you tell him what to do? He wants to jump over a bridge, let him jump over a bridge. And this is actually some of the things that he shows as examples himself in the book of how he gives examples. He's actually proud of these examples. He says, some kid, some kid, I uh, uh, tried to commit suicide. Baruch Hashem failed. 14-year-old kid came to Manus Friedman and tells Manus Friedman, listen, some priest told me something stupid that I shouldn't kill myself because God loves me. Manus Friedman says, you're right. That is stupid. God doesn't love you. He doesn't love you. You're like a burden on him. 
He's stuck with you, he says to him. He's stuck with you. Why is he stuck with me? Oh, because he needs you. He needs you to do these mitzvot. Like God is the needy one. Literally transforming some of the stuff he said in lectures into something much, much worse in a book format. In a book format. Unbelievable. Changing the, the, the Torah and distorting it in such a fashion that it's unprecedented. But yet, few are willing to say a single word against this Rasha, who has printed countless pages, now both in Hebrew as well as in English, and I'm sure probably other languages, full of heresy that's against the Torah, and yet they say, no, this is the, this is the teachings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I promise you, it's not the teachings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Because the Lubavitcher Rebbe was not a heretic. Manus Friedman is a heretic. Who says that God needs you. Which is a violation, a desecration of the Torah in such an extent that it's a violation of one of the 13 principles of faith. Now, the majority of the world today are clueless. But then there are people that are aware. There are rabbis, Rosh Shivot, Dayanim, that have gotten this information in front of them. Over the years, that we've spoken against him and others, agree this is the case, but choose to do nothing. Or others defend him. Say, no, this is Hasidut. Say, show me a source in Hasidut that says this. Oh, it's the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Show me a Lubavitcher Rebbe that says this. Oh, it's a uh, Kabbalah. Show me a Kabbalah source that says this. Show me a Baal Shem Tov that says this. Show me anybody in the world that says this. God needs you and all that mumbo jumbo that he says. Show me anybody in the history of Am Yisrael that says to a uh, 14, 15 year old little girl that tried to commit suicide that... God doesn't love her and he just has to deal with her. She's a burden. Show me. Show me. How anybody in Ami Sleil would say such a thing that God owes them an apology for putting them through the exile for 2,000 years. Show me, show me, show me, somebody. Nobody said it. Says Rashi on the Pasuk. On the Pasuk. Do not declare your judicial opinion upon the grievance of the uh, by veering. Rashi says, do not respond regarding a dispute in the matter by follows the uh, the majority. Why majority? Majority of evil. Rashi says sometimes the majority, the majority is steering towards evil. So even though it's the majority, the majority is defending evil. The majority chooses to stay quiet while evil continues to grow. You don't follow it. They'll get punished and you'll get saved. But if you follow it, you'll get punished just like them. You'll get punished just like them, Hashem Shmuel. Now, going back to the Chinuch. Going back to the Chinuch, where he says that in the event that you don't have a clear opinion based on your own understanding, but you wish to remain silent regarding what's in your heart with respect to this case, and instead follow the words of others, you may not do so. Staying quiet forbidden not as a judge and not as an individual why there's an obligation for the individual it's a mitzvah of protesting when you see something that's wrong mitzvah of rebuking which are two separate mitzvot when it's a judge you have the mitzvah of executing the judgment and this is not the, just the chinuch's opinion the mechilta the mechilta the rashbi says the same he says that this teaches you that you may not say that it's sufficient for me to be like uh, such and such rabbi. Meaning that uh, I don't need to vote 
and add my own decision and pretend like you're humble because I can fulfill my responsibility as a judge by reiterating the decision that my fellow judge, who is a great Torah scholar, says the Mechilta, you may not say this. Rather, you must state your own opinion in accordance to what you see before you. See, we see that when it comes to judgment, you can't just show up to court and fill in a seat. Further, the uh, the Chinuch says that we don't only learn just this from this verse. Rather, we learn several other laws. What other laws do we learn from this particular verse? This one mitzvah. Mitzvah number 77, we learned several other laws. One, that you may not simply repeat the opinion of another judge. Two, that a judge who advances an argument for acquittal may not reverse himself during the uh, deliberations and advance an argument of conviction. Three, the deliberations may not begin with an argument for conviction, but must begin with an argument for acquittal. And four, that the preeminent judge may not be the first voice to opinion, his opinion. So here we see the Chinuch tells us, wait a minute, this, this mitzvah number 77, this one thing that I told you about how you have to make sure you have the righteous judge and you can't just let the uh, rely on somebody else's opinion. That's not the only thing that we learned from this verse. We learned three other mitzvot from it. Hold on a second. The uh, how could it be that we learn so much from one mitzvah, from one uh, from one verse? And also we learned that this is an exception that uh, between capital case and monetary case. But we're not going to get into that now. But how do we do this? How, how does it work? that you learn so much from uh, one mitzvah. Says the Chinuch, this is what our sages mean when they say that there is 70 faces to the Torah. This is what 70 faces to the Torah means. That you see that the uh, same verse can teach you different things without you changing the verse in any way, shape, or form. You could have countless different understandings that apply to different things without contradicting each other. Many people think that 70 faces to the Torah means that, oh, here it means black, the other one says white. Yeah, but they contradict each other. Yeah, it means both. How is that 70 faces? It sounds like it's a different diamond. 70 faces to the Torah is like 70 facets to the same diamond. So this is a small example, and I I think it's a fantastic example, of what 70 faces to the Torah means. Now why did I bring you all of this, aside from the reason of there's a lot to learn here? Because the Chinuch elaborates on all of this at the end, and he says the following. That because God knows that Am Yisrael has accepted the Torah and by the virtue of them following the path that they have been commanded to follow, the way of the Torah, they would be qualified to receive the wisdom and understanding and as a result of this understanding would perceive in the Torah all that is required for the proper administration of all that is necessary for them in the world and therefore he left matters veiled in various places in scripture leaving only allusions to these laws and he transmitted the explanation of these things to them orally by the way of the great intermediary who was between the nation and himself Moshe Rabbeinu together with the written law in which matters were not stated explicitly God gave Moshe the oral law which contains the complete explanation of all the laws of the Torah. Here, the Chinuch says, if you're asking me 
how come this mitzvah literally says there's a prohibition upon a judge to argue for conviction in a capital case after first having argued for acquittal you're telling me it has to do with the judge and how he behaves specifically not to rely on the majority or somebody else's opinion but then you just took that one verse without adding or subtracting anything and you branched out three other laws and you're calling that the 70 faces of the Torah so the question is how come Hashem did not reveal this in three different other verses meaning there's four different laws give me four different sentences why do I need one verse to mean four different things so says the Chinuch what the Chazonish said Chinuch says, because Am Yisrael accepted the Torah, because, not they accepted the Torah, just, oh, give it to us, how much is it? Free. How much you have? Two. Okay, I'll take the oral and the written. No! Because they accepted the Torah in their life, they said, Nasev and Nishma, because they said, we're going to follow what Torah says, we're going to apply it to our life, we're going to keep Shabbat, we're going to keep kosher, we're going to keep this, we're going to keep that, we're going to do it ah you're gonna accept my Torah so surely I don't need to spell things out for you why don't I need to spell out things out for you if you by default you accepting my Torah creates a new reality where you now have a special siyata dishmaya a special assistance from heaven to understand the hidden meanings in the Torah therefore Hashem says I don't need to spell it out for you why because your acceptance of the Torah opens up your mind in such a fashion that the other people in the world do not have. That's why the Gemara in Mesechet Megillah says, Chokhmah b'goyim ta'amin, Torah b'goyim al ta'amin. Wisdom in the nations, the Gentile nations, they tell you that there's wisdom. They know how to build bridges, they know how to fly, they know how to do all types of math, no problem. Science, no problem, believe it. If they tell you there's really, really smart people among the nations, believe it. If they tell you that there is Torah among the nations, don't believe it. Why? Because in order to have, in order to have Torah among the nations, you have to accept the Torah. You have to accept the Torah because to have Torah means you have to have an understanding of what's in front of you. You have to have an understanding of not just what the basic meaning of the verse is, but all of the other branches. And the only way you're going to get an understanding, a true comprehension of all of these other branches even existing in the first place is by accepting the Torah in the first place. And the fact that you don't accept the Torah means that there's no way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will unfold any of these things to you. Hence the reason why the nations, they read the Torah like they read a Harry Potter book. They read it literally and that's why they find idol worship everywhere. They, all they can find is idol worship. It doesn't matter which page they open, they find their idol, Yoshke, everywhere. Even though you're never going to find them in a single page in the Torah, they find them everywhere. Why? Because they have a bias. They have an agenda. They're looking for their idol. So, of course, they're going to create it. But are they going to find the truth? They're not going to find the truth. Why? Because they didn't accept anything. To get the truth, you have to accept the truth. And if you are waiting for the truth to come to you before you accept it, like those who says, I don't want nothing to do with you. I have already my people. My people accepted the truth before I even gave it to them. They said, Naaseh v'nishma. So here we have the Chinuch. The Chinuch tells us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not have to spell out every little intricate detail in the written Torah, even though it's all in there. He doesn't have to spell it. Why? Because by us accepting the Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, that in itself creates a reality where you will be able to see things in the same Torah that no other nation in the world can see. Hence the reason of why when you read the explanation of the Chinu or the rest of the sages of how they interpret these verses, you think to yourself, first of all, this is purely divine uh, intellect. This is not human. Second of all, it's obvious. It's not like you don't debate it. Oh, they say black, but in reality it's pink, and you just have to like close your eyes and think it's pink. No, no, no. It's as clear as day, especially when you read some of the halachas or some of the intricate laws. 
you read it, you understand it. It's like, how could I not see it? 30 seconds below. I, I read this 50 times. Never understood it. Today, I understand it. How? How come 50 times it didn't work? Apparently, you didn't earn the merit until the 50th time. You have to have the merit. What's the merit? Accepting the Torah. Accepting the Holy Torah gives you the merit to understand the Holy Torah. Hence the reason of why the Chazoni says, we go back to the Chazoni. Chazoni says, what did he say? He says that these judges, that they're bribed, before they got bribed, they had a protection. They had a shroud over them, protecting them to keep making the right judgment. The second they accepted the judgment, by default, it turned them into a liar. By default, it turned them into a wrong judge. Why a wrong judge? Because that protection that they had is now gone. Now you're going to say, yeah, but he could still potentially make the right decision. Answer is no. Why no? David Melech says in Tehilim 101, Tehilim 101, verse 7. David Melech says, in the midst of my house, shall not dwell a practitioner of deceit one who tells lies shall not be established before my eyes so here we see that david melech david melech is saying that anyone that is a deceitful person i don't want him in my house who says and one who tells lies it's never going to be uh it's never going to get the chance to see the salvation that the who wants to bring the righteous people so the basic meaning here is that the uh, deceitful one is going to be denied admission to the Bet Hamikdash, both of the pre- of the past and the present or future. And second is that all people, all men, are destined to stand in front of a Kadosh Baruch Hu in the world to come, except for four groups of people. As the Gemara Masechet Sotah, page forty-two, says, four different types of people are not going to. Enjoy the privilege of being in front of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and one of them is liars. Now the question comes, why did David Melech write the verse this way, where it says that the deceitful person will not be in the house, and the one that tells lies will not be established? Shouldn't it be, if he tells lies, he won't be in my house? Like meaning that the, the lies should come first? No. Why? Because says the Rav Ephraim, that this is talking about what kind of deceit? Deceit in the Bedin. This is talking about what we're talking about. This is not just deceit. This is deceit in the Bedin. Why? Because it says, you, uh, in the midst of my house shall not dwell a practitioner of deceit. So who, uh, what's the Shem's house? Shem's house is the Bedin. The Bedin is like a whose house. That's where his law is executed. The Bedin is a Baruch whose house. So one that is a, uh, a practitioner of deceit, that person is the problem. That's the problem, right? He says, because he was deceitful in the house, he accepted the bribe. Right? That's what deceit is. He accepted the bribe. Because he accepted the bribe, it led him to what? To lie. What do you mean to lie? Because he accepted the bribe, he now has a desire, a desire to lie just to acquit the briber. He now has a new desire that he didn't have before the bribe. Before the bribe, he didn't even know who the guy was. After the bribe, all of a sudden he's going to do whatever he can, including lying for the sake of acquitting his briber. Why? Because he has this new lust, this new lust to Please is briber. Now, the Chinuch continues. The Chinuch continues and says the following. When we go to fast forward, we go to mitzvah number 81. 
So I'm number 81. What's Misba number 81? We were at 77, we jumped four. What's Misba number 81? It's a different type of judgment. What's the judgment? The prohibition to bend the judgment of a rasha. The prohibition of bending the judgment of a sinner because of his wickedness. Don't bend the judgment of your destitute person in his grievance. Exodus 23, 6. Now, first, the Chinuch explains why is a destitute referring to a wicked person and not a uh, destitute like a poor person. So the Chinuch, first of all, explains that. He says that you're not allowed to tilt the judgment against uh, one of the litigants even when the judge knows that this person is a wicked sinful person now even though the uh, judge knows that this person is wicked and sinful Torah tells them, even that person don't, don't don't change the judgment. So why why is it that uh, first of all why is this? First of all, we have a different mitzvah, a different mitzvah that says not to tilt the judgment for people that are poor. So of course the, the Torah doesn't repeat itself for no reason. Second of all, it's specifically telling us that this person is a uh, sinner because of his wickedness. And it's trying to teach us something that the judge that uses his own logic rather than the Torah logic will rationalize that since this guy is a wicked person he stole money and everybody's trying to get money back from him now in this case he's innocent but we still want the money back for the other cases so if I get the money back i charge him here even though he's innocent here i'm really gonna help people out because those people that are after him for the money that he stole from them he had a ponzi scheme and he stole 10 million dollars here really he's being sued but uh there's nothing here no case but i'll charge him with the 10 million to give it back to the other 10 million Torah says no thank you not allowed to do such a thing even if you know he's wicked and he stole and there's no other way to collect the money from his other crimes you're still not allowed to do such a thing why because that would be a distortion of judgment that would be a distortion of judgment what about punishing him for his previous acts that Everybody's chasing him after. It's not for you to punish him. That's for Kadosh Baruch Hu to do. We are allowed to deliver the judgment in the Bedin. That's where it ends. You're not allowed to do anything outside of what the law is. You cannot take the law into your own hands. Now take the law into your own hands. Now that we go. And fast forward again to our mitzvah. The mitzvah we've been talking about this whole time. What does the chinuch have to say about the prohibition of bribery? Mitzvah number 83. Do not accept a bribe. For the bribe will blind those who see and corrupt words that are just to hear the uh um the chinuch says that we're commanded that a judge may not accept a bribe from the litigants even if it's accepted with the intention to judge the case truthfully do not accept a bribe the prohibition of to this effect against accepting a bribe even to judge tr- truthfully is repeated elsewhere in the Torah in the Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 19 and it's stated in uh, Sifri that you shall not accept the bribe 
and it prohibits the acceptance of a bribe even if it's with the intention to exonerate the one who is truly innocent and to impose liability on one who is truly liable so here we see that the logic behind this mitzvah is not human logic why because we would think naturally that bribery automatically means that i'm bribing him to change the law i know that i'm guilty and i'm giving him a bribe to tell the world i'm innocent chinuch says no no that you don't need a you don't need an explanation for that and that's what chinuch says later on i don't need to write explanation that this is also meant by this mitzvah the explanation that i'm going to give you is what's not obvious for what's obvious that don't bribe to change the law that you don't need an explanation that's simple logic because we all know the chinuch says that the world cannot exist without law without law and order the world cannot exist what i'm going to explain to you is the other aspect the other facet of the diamond that is not so obvious what is that other facet of the diamond you're not allowed to bribe even if it is to bring out the truth how could that be let's say you have a judgment and you know you're right the other guy stole from you but it's not so obvious to prove that he stole from you without doing some serious investigation so you decide you know what let me help out this judge there's a lot of money on the line and also my reputation hey rabbi judge do me a favor do some investigation on this case you'll see that what the truth is here you go there's a little envelope for you to pay for the expenses of research it takes time you need assistance and so on here you go you give him a little envelope nice five thousand thick envelope to do research not because you lied because you told the truth there's a million dollars on the line you can't afford to uh be uh to lose this case so you figure let me make an investment i'm gonna give money to the betty to help them out research and find the truth i'm not telling them to judge for me i'm telling them to simply use the money to research the case says the torah not allowed not allowed to do such a thing that's what the law is for where to pay the judge to research a case thoroughly and issue a decisive ruling instead of opting to impose a compromise is a corruption of judgment meaning this the Torah calls this a bribe because it influences the manner in which the judge adjudicates the case even if it appears to promote justice it's still corruption now anyone that has been in court before understands the level of divine genius i just said here not that i created this is all to up but a normal human being would not think of such a thing why because you figure listen i have justice in my hand i'm not even telling them to tell the world i'm right i'm just giving him money to verify that i'm right that's it Torah says forbidden why you are changing the way that they do judgments if they wanted to investigate they don't need you to remind them if they thought they needed help that uh, they needed uh, to, to investigate they would do it they don't need your extra five thousand dollars to do that the Chinur says the purpose of this mitzvah where we're prohibited to accept a bribe even when the intention is to judge the case truthfully is in order to remove this evil habit of bribery from our midst lest we come to accustoming ourselves with this habit of accepting bribery even for 
and innocuous purposes, and issue false judgments due to the influence of bribery. This is a clear and obvious matter which requires no proof. So here, the reason behind this mitzvah being such a way is because bribery for falsehood is such an abomination that we cannot afford to allow even bribery to bring the truth. Because just the fact that we'll accustom ourselves to bribe, it's inevitable for us to bribe for the wrong thing. It's welcoming the abomination into the house. As the Torah says, Don't bring toiva, don't bring an uh, abomination into your house. The Stipe Gaon says that's a television, probably an internet also for, for many people who don't know how to control themselves and give their kids complete control of uh, freedom of uh, telephones and internet and everything else in between. The Chinuch continues and says that among the laws of this mitzvah is that the sages have said, that both the one giving the bribe and the one receiving transgress the mitzvah prohibitions. The one receiving transgresses the prohibition of accepting a bribe, while the one that uh, um, while the transgression on the one giving the bribe is on the account of you shall not place a stumbling block be, uh, before the blind. So this is very similar to lending money with interest where lending money of an interest, one Jew to another, is prohibited according to the Torah, where everybody that's involved is sinning against the Torah to such an extent that they give up their right to be resurrected with the dead. The one that lent the money, the one that received the money, and is paying interest on it, and the broker. In so many words, the entire cash advance business has no share of the world to come. Says the Chinuch, this mitzvah of uh, bribery is very similar. The one that bribed and the one that received the bribe. Both are violating the Torah. Both are violating the Torah. And if the judge violated this prohibition and accepted the bribe, he's in the category of Ahu, accursed. And he's subject to the curse expressed by the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 25. A curse is the one who takes a bribe, meaning he has the worst curse on him possible. And Chinuch says that he has to return the bribe to the person that gave it to him. Whether that's going to remove the curse right away or not, that obviously is decided by Kadosh Baruch Hu. But nonetheless, the person that accepted a bribe has some serious, serious problems with Kadosh Baruch Hu. Also, he says that it's not only money that's uh, prohibited, but also non-money bribe, or non-monetary bribes, such as flattery, where a judge should uh, demonstrate that he pays absolutely no attention to compliments. If the litigant wants to uh, give him uh, honor with words, he's supposed to ignore it altogether. Because not only is the, would the judge not accept the bribe because that will influence the judgment, but he also is not allowed to accept payment from the litigants for handling the case altogether. The only thing they're allowed to do is they, uh, accept uh, cost. If, let's say, you uh, typically you work somewhere else, so the cost of you uh, losing money are that uh, the schar batala, that uh, you would get otherwise, but you can't inflate it for judging. Now, the two elaborates on this in the Choshen Mishpat, and he says that a judge must be extremely cautious not to accept a bribe. where 
The two is actually using me'od me'od, like very, very cautious. Because if you're not extra cautious with this issue, surely you're going to fall for it. Because the Gemara says in Masechet Ketubot, page 105a, that if a litigant so much as removed a feather from the judge's head or extended his hand to assist the judge when, open, when crossing a bridge, that judge is disqualified from judging in a Bedin for him. And the Chinuch writes that flattery too is also a form of bribery. So therefore the judge must be aware that even a simple greeting by the litigant, if he's not normally someone that he would greet, is considered a bribe. Now a person is going to ask a fantastic question. These very same Dayanim are typically, especially in the old days, people that deal with other halachic issues, such as kashrut. Not only kashrut for others, but kashrut for themselves. You can say kashrut for others has its own, maybe the supervisors, maybe there's somebody double-checking things, maybe there's the people themselves, the customers, but no, in the old days, people would that knew how to slaughter, which was very common, especially people that were Talmud Chachamim, that were judges, they would know how to slaughter. And they would decide after they slaughtered whether this animal is kasher or taref. Now, the difference between kasher and taref sometimes is literally yirat shamayim, just having the fear of the Almighty, because something could be not kosher, but a person would because of his difficulty, because of his poverty, his circumstances, simply decide to close an eye and decide that, no, I don't see this uh, as a problem. And it happens. This is also why in Eretz Yisrael, you're not allowed to uh, eat at uh, a uh, restaurant where the owner is a Mechalil Shabbat. Even if he says that all of the meat in his store is kosher, you're not allowed to believe him that it's kosher meat. Not allowed. Why? Because although it's kosher meat is much more accessible in Israel than it is in any other country in the world, still, a person that does not care enough about their own neshama to keep Shabbat, surely he's not going to care enough about your neshama to really give you kosher food like he says he will. This is also the reason why you're not allowed to eat the food of someone that doesn't uh, keep Shabbat. The only leniency there is, is if it's your mother and your mother is respectful and not anti-Torah and she knows that uh, you only eat kosher food, then Rabbi Vadya says that there could be a leniency with your own mother. But anybody else, your friend, your uh, brother, your cousin, your whoever, they don't keep Shabbat and they cook for you, you're not allowed to eat their food. Needless to say, some complete stranger that owns a restaurant and cooked food, you cannot eat his food. And Eretz Yisrael, they do not give him a kashrut. They don't give him a kashrut. Because you cannot trust him. Why? Because easily he could take something that he tells you, this is steak from a kosher cow. And in reality, it could be donkey meat. Or it could be non-kosher cow. That is a fraction of the price. Since he doesn't care enough about his own neshama to observe Shabbat, surely he's not going to care enough about your neshama to give you kosher food, because in his mind, it's all nonsense. He's only in the kosher business because of capitalism, not because uh, he uh, likes religious people. If he liked religious people so much, he'd become one of them. So now, back to our question. Chachamim asks, these very same dayanim, that we are saying they are not to be trusted when it comes to bribes. Even if the bribe is for the sake of bringing out justice. 
Now that very same judge, he has his own financial issues. Sometimes they're very poor. And he has to shecht. He has to slaughter his own sheep, his own cow, whatever it is. And double check that it's kosher meat before he himself consumes it. For he himself eats it. So surely we trust him that he's only gonna, he's only eating kosher meat. So how come we can trust him to eat kosher meat even though technically over there he has a bias? What's the bias? Listen, this this uh, sheep is the only sheep I have. If it's not kosher, if 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 the lungs are not what uh, I'm saying they are. This thing is not kosher. My whole house doesn't have any food to eat. We have to wait another week before we eat meat or maybe another month or maybe uh, people are going to starve. So I need this to be kosher. Yeah, but you need to be kosher. Whether it's kosher, it's two different things. So how can we trust this Dayan to actually decide the right thing with his own meat, slaughter his own sheep, and decide that it's really kosher, but we don't trust him to use the bribe the right way to bring justice out? It's a good question, right? The Chazonish says the, 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 the answer that they give is from the Chazonish. Is from the Chazonish. Which is that it's not about trusting the person with righteousness or wickedness, but rather it's a reality. That has changed. That Dayan, we're not questioning his righteousness. Surely, if he sees that the cow he just slaughtered for himself is not kosher, he has studied Torah his whole life, he has a desire to do good, surely he's going to decide the right thing. If it's not kosher, he's not going to eat it. But the second that he got bribed, Says the Chazonish, the reality has changed. Because now he has a new desire that he's not trained for. A new desire that's not there all the time. It's a temporary desire to please the briber. Meaning that this, this bribe is not telling you that there's a possibility of something bad happening. But rather, it's dictating, it's confirming that certainly bad things are happening. Meaning, the bribe is something that always leads to bad things. Always leads to further corruption and lying and so on. That's the difference. Because the, it's not an indication of reality, but rather a dictation of reality. And then comes the Rebbe Misatmel with the Chidush that for me, if you wanted to pay for it a million dollars, I tell you it's not enough. The Rebbe Misatmel brings an extraordinary Chidush on this exact sugya in his Chuvot uh, Be'er Moshe, in the sixth volume. And he says the following, I'm going to read it verbatim. There is another place in the Torah where the prohibition against um, bribery is mentioned, which we mentioned before, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19. And over there it says, Velotikach shochad, ki ashochad ya'aver ene chachamim, v'yisalev divre tzadikim says that you shall not accept a bribe for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and corrupt the words of the righteous. So the Rebbe Misatma says that according to the literal interpretation of this verse, tzadikim means righteous. Tzadikim is meaning to righteous people and it's plural. And this creates a complication in the verse. Why? Because it says, don't bribe the, blo- the uh, um, 
Don't accept the bribe because the, bl- the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and corrupt the words of the righteous. The righteous is, is a, uh, a plural. So it says that how can a judge who accepts a bribe be called righteous? That's the first complication. Second complication is that the commandment not to accept a bribe is in the second person. It says, Lotikach, that you shall not accept. Whereas the outcome of the bribe's acceptance is accept in a third person, in a plural. That it's going to, Ya'aver enei chachamim, v'yisalev divrei tzadikim, that it will blind the eyes of the wise, which is uh, plural, and it'll corrupt the words of the righteous, which is also plural. So the accepting the bribe is singular in third person, and the uh, the corruption is plural. So the Rebbe Misatmer explains that this verse reflects on the fact that the bed din ordinarily consists of at least three judges. And one judge will reason that, may reason that, no harm will come out if he accepts a bribe. Because even if he himself is favoring one of the litigants unfairly, the one that bribed him, there's two other judges that are not biased. And they're going to see everything the right way. And they're going to outvote him anyway. So the court's ruling will turn out correct. Even if he accepts the bribe. And to eliminate this thought, the Torah enjoins the single judge not to accept the bribe, lest he be so influenced by the bribe because of this new desire that he has. He be influenced by this bribe to the extent where his passionate arguments on the behalf of his beneficiary, the briber, will end up swaying the other judges to his own corrupt view. And therefore the verse now says, you, singular, shall not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and the corrupt words of the righteous, both being plural, meaning that your acceptance of the bribe will cause even the other judges, who are actually wise and righteous, as they did not accept a bribe, but they will become blinded and it will cause their words to become corrupted. Here we see the Chokhmah, at least a little inkling of the Chokhmah of one of the giants of the generation, where you see how their brain works and what Siyat Dishmaya looks like, where you see how they take the same exact verse that we did and show you another facet of the very same diamond that no power on earth would we have been able to see it on our own. Well, I tell you, listen, this verse is mentioned a couple of times. Surely there's a slight difference. What's the slight difference? There's a basic minimum difference that you can understand by the sages. But there's an inner difference. There's a deeper difference. The deeper difference is that the entire two hours we've been talking about this, the Rebbe Misatmer explained in three lines. He says the whole act of taking the bribe can easily be justified by the guy that's very smart and say, listen, I'm going to accept the bribe because I need to pay tuition for my kids. I need to help some poor people. He'll justify his corruption in one way or another. But I'm not worried about corrupting judgment because there's two other bigger judges than me there's two other bigger judges than me and surely the law the first time it's mentioned in the torah not to accept the bribe it says that the biggest judge he speaks last and uh, I, I who am i i'm the smallest judge so he's gonna speak after i say my piece i'm, a, I'm the smallest judge the other guy is bigger than me also too bigger than me they're gonna obviously know what they want to do I don't need to help them so even if I accept the bribe these two other judges I can't bribe them 
I can't do anything with them. They're they're on their own. Says the Rebbe Misatna, the Torah is warning you that as soon as you accept that bribe, you're no longer the same person as you were before you took the bribe. You now have a newfound desire, a newfound lust to please your beneficiary, to please the one who bribed you. It's a desire you have no idea how to cope with. It's a lust, it's a tava that's unlike anything else you've dealt with. Which means that the moment you accept that bribe, you now will become a lot more passionate than you are before you accepted the bribe. Passionate for something that you may have not even believed in before you accepted the bribe. But passionate to the extent where when you say what you think, you are now going to say it with such passion and the Rebbe Misatma says, even such conviction that he'll create a chidush, a corrupt chidush using Torah terminology in order to justify his corrupt case. But you're going to say that chidush with such passion and conviction that even the bigger judges, the bigger judges will be blinded by your passion will be blinded by your bribe and fall prey to this bribe, hence bringing a bad judgment to the world. And once there is bad judgment in the world, Rabotai Yekarim, the consequences are horrific. As the Mishnah in Avot says, plague comes to the world. For death penalties prescribed by the Torah that were not carried out by the court, and for the illegal use of fruits in a seventh sabbatical year, and the sword, war, comes to the world for delay of justice, or the perversion of justice, or for rendering decisions contrary to Allah. The Mishnah in Avot says that there is a plague that comes to the world from people that are desecrating the Torah and it was supposed to be killed at the time of the Sanhedrin. All these people desecrating Shabbat. All of these people committing all types of immorality in the open. This homosexuality, this filth that's in the world. That's bringing a plague to the world. I.e. Corona, Omicron, AIDS, cancer, all of these things. They're brought by the evil of people. And before everybody out there thinks, okay, well, I'm not one of those. Perhaps. But what about the corrupt of justice? The corrupt of justice, Rabutai, is something that could pertain to each and every single one of us, but especially those that are in a position of power where they see people that are desecrating Hashem's name, they see people that are inviting missionaries to synagogues. They see people that are preaching homosexuality as if it's a mitzvah. They see people desecrating the Torah on a regular basis and simply say nothing. That is what's bringing the war. The very same war everybody's worried about right now between Ukraine and Russia. Don't be so worried. You created it. You can stop it. How? In the same solution as we also said in the beginning of this year. Tshuva. When we do tshuva, we bring good to the world. Good to us and good to the rest of society. Be'ezat Hashem, this too will be an additional chizuk for each and one of us to be righteous according to the Torah. To be just according to the Torah. To never take bribes and never give bribes. Never try to take the law into your own hands because we have a Kadosh Baruch Hu to run the world. And if a Kadosh Baruch Hu sees that you are righteous, he'll protect you even beyond what you think is possible. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen v'amen. You're never going to believe it. 
the Christian missionaries, one for Israel, Eitan and Moti, Anastasia, the rest of the team, they're attacking us and they're lying again. Well, actually, you are going to believe it because missionaries have been doing that for about 2,000 years. Well, let the show go on. About a year ago, on February 28, 2021, we released a short film, which was an excerpt of an older lecture, where I told the story of Rabbi Daniel Lasor telling that told the story to my rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon, where he met with Eitan uh, Bar and uh, Moti at a uh, cafe where they had a debate. And after that debate, they, uh, they, they you know, the missionaries, of course, lost the debate and they got violent. And they, uh, uh, the expression that I use, they uh, uh, tried to break his bones. And now, of course, I didn't say they actually beat him up. And anyone that watches the film, which is called What Happened When Missionaries One for Israel Met Rabbi Daniel Asor, Bezat Hashem film. I didn't say they actually beat him up, but I used the expression that's very common among us, the Middle Eastern, Sephardics, especially Israelis. Nonetheless, this is not the first time anybody's used that expression, but I said they tried to break his bones. Never actually say they beat him up. But the missionaries, they took that as that. They said that I did say that they beat him up. And I am a liar. And they came out with a video about a month and a half later on April 6th. Where they said that I have uh, maliciously lied about them. I said that they beat him up. Uh, they, uh, you know, they're victims. They, uh, this is another example of how the, uh, the rabbis are lying about, uh, about the, uh, the Christians in order to slow them down, and on and on and on and on and on. Just simply the same show over and over again where the missionaries play victim while actually being the perpetrator, the missionaries lying about being liars. So, this happened a year ago. And, of course, we didn't have a, uh, a response video to it. We didn't respond to it at all. We simply just let people see what the truth is and decide for themselves. Of course, many people contacted me because these guys spent a ton of money, a ton of money to market this video of theirs, which was publishing our video. Why would you do such a thing? If you notice the statistics, which we're going to put on the screen, Anyone that's familiar with, you know, launching videos on the internet and so on knows that the first week or so after you launch a video is when you're going to get the majority of your, of your views. So after the first week that we launched this video, our video, we got about 3,300 views. It's a, not bad, Baruch Hashem, that's what we got. Now, after that week, it died out. So for the next month and a half or so, which was the time period between that and when they launched their video on April 6th, well, it only got a couple of hundred more views. So by the time they actually launched their video on April 6th, the video, our video got 3,750 views. Now, after that, after they launched their video, and you see over the next couple of months, in fact, our video woke up again as a result of their video and doubled its views, got another 3,700 views. So in essence, their video market on our video even better than what we do for ourselves. And over the next year since then, it continued increasing as their video continued increasing. Now, what's the difference? Their video got over 106,000 views to date. We're now in February of 2022. Their video has 106,000 views. Our video has about 10,000 views. So we're talking about a factor of 10, 10 to 1. Now, why would they spend so much effort, time, uh, a, uh, resources, money to market this video if it was so damaging to hear what I said, that they supposedly beat them up? If anything, you should quiet it down. You should uh, uh, not market it. I mean, technically, my video already died out by the time you marketed yours. Well, let me tell you a secret about these missionaries. Their whole job is to try to gain as much uh, content as possible where that content has to do with any dialogue they have with the rabbinical world. So the whole purpose behind them spending a fortune, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars probably, uh, is in order to gain more content, in order to make themselves look like victims, in order to look like make us look like evil people, and to show how 
they are doing the right thing they are righteous and we are wicked well today we're going to show you another real version of what they really are and i promise you it has nothing to do with righteous first and foremost you should know statistically as i said their video marketed ours why would you do such a thing well if you want to if you want to if you have an agenda the first agenda was to show that i was a liar we're going to prove that otherwise in a moment second was that they actually said that uh they were obviously hurt by this whole thing and uh that uh this happened recently that part of my lie was that i said that this meeting between them and the rabbi daniel Asso was recently now everyone that follows my videos knows that we take excerpts of older lectures and uh and make them into short films so the uh everyone understood that this film didn't just happen right there and then it's a uh, but what did they do to make people believe that they took a uh short clip of one of my recent videos and they added it to their video so if you notice my video okay the actual film itself that we published and you sh see their version of my video you'll see that their version is slightly different what's different they added a picture in picture and in that picture in picture you see me talking so it looks like it's the current version of me it's the more recent version of me that changed looks a little bit over the last few years and you see how oh this this must have happened five minutes ago why because again it adds to it adds to the uh to the feel to the feel that they are the victims and we are the liars but of course once you actually notice that there is a uh, uh this is not authentic you realize who's the liar The other thing is that they mentioned that uh, they got a testimony from Rabbi Daniel Asor that he agrees with them that I'm a liar. He said that I'm a liar. Daniel Asor wrote me back and verified in writing that this is an untrue story, a myth, actually using the word a lie. Well, good news is, is that we had to double check that. Did he actually in fact say I'm a liar? Well, let's see. Rabbi Daniel Asor heard, you know, told the story to my rabbi, Rabbi Frank Kachlam. I don't know Rabbi Daniel Asor personally. I've only spoken to him a couple of times in my life, but uh, uh, that was many years ago. But as far as a, uh, as far as this whole story it was really between him and Rabbi Ephraim. So right after they published this video, we reached out. Rabbi Ephraim reached out to him, and they had a uh, communication via WhatsApp. And what did Rabbi Daniel Asor say? You're going to hear it in a moment, and that's the that's the key. You're going to hear him saying it. And he's gonna say what actually transpired that they had the debate after the debate Eitan Bar did get physically threatening bumping his chest into uh, aggressively into Rabbi Daniel Asor as if uh, trying to uh, uh, implicate that he wants to fight him Rabbi Daniel Asor had to restrain him by taking his two hands and putting them together of course trying to uh, stop something from getting out of hand because he was getting threatening he was getting violent and this Rabotai, is what the missionaries don't want you to believe so how could it be that rabbi daniel asor called me a liar he called the story a lie what's the story a lie they told him that i said that they hit him so he said that's not true that's a lie you didn't hit me so of course the question they asked or the, the what they said their statement which is in essence a lie about what I said is that yes they said I that he uh, they hit him he said no that's a lie you didn't hit me Every, you know you didn't hit me but the good news is I didn't say they hit him I said they tried so they got aggressive and that's why he answered the way he answered and that's why we had to get this on recording not some hearsay you're gonna hear it from rabbi daniel asor הם פנו אליי וטענו שאתם פרסמתם שאתם שברתם לי את העצמות שהם שברו לי את העצמות שהם הרבצו לי מכות 
אז אני אה, אמרתי שזה לא כך, שאני לא סיפרתי את הסיפור כך. נכון, הייתי עם שומרי ראש, הרב, אה, אה, היה שם, שם יחיעם, מנהל המחלקה אה, נגד נצרות, היה שם אה, בנימין אה, אה, קלוגר. אה, אה, נכון, מה זה החל להתלהם? אני, כשאני אומר, הוא החל להתלהם, נכון, הוא ניסה, כאילו, הוא בא עם החזה שלו, ו... ונכון, אני הצמדתי לו את הידיים, אבל זה לא לשבור את העצמות, זה לא להרביץ מכות, זה לא... לא הוא לא תקף, מה זה תקף? זה, זה מה שהיה, אני מספר לך בדיוק מה היה, תקרא לזה איך שאתה רוצה לקרוא לזה. זה הכל, הוא, נכון, הוא התחיל להתלהם, הוא בא עם החזה שלו, ונצמדתי לו את הידיים, זה הכל. וחשבתי שלכן לא ראוי להיפגש איתו שוב פעם. כל העניין היה אם להיפגש איתו שוב או לא, כשהוא ביקש להיפגש uh, לוויכוח, ואמרתי שאין מה להיפגש עם בן אדם כזה, שאז הוא היה בחור צעיר והיום הוא, לא יודע, כבר עושה דוקטורט בתחום, uh, אבל uh, טענתי שזה יהיה חיול השם לחשוף uh, את הסטודנטים מאוניברסיטת תל אביב לוויכוח מהסוג הזה, לתת לו במה. ואדם שהתנהג לא, לא ראוי לדעתי בסוף המפגש הזה, לא שווה להיפגש איתו וגם לא שווה לתת לו במה, זה הכל. I've been sitting on this for over a year because there was simply no reason to expose this to the public. I had a couple of close students that knew about it. The rest of the people, there was simply no reason. But now there is a reason. It's time to show the real face of the lying person. Filthy, filthy, lying missionaries, Eitan and Moti, from One for Israel and the rest of their staff. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'Amen.
אני מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעיון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, ראש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל מה שיפנו יזכירו ויצליחו, יזכירו לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הגדילו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. בעזרת השם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. במיאמי. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעבירו לו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן. קהילה ספרדית גדולה.